If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're taking one week off from Judges as we prepare for our fall schedule. School now starting back in July, and we generally, to some extent, follow the, follow the school calendar uh, with our planning. So we're changing some things up, and I'm preaching this morning from Acts chapter 2. In the book of Acts, we have, uh, as many of you will know, the, the recordings of the early church. Uh, Jesus has given his great commission. He's risen from the dead. The disciples have made this tremendous transition in chapters 1 and 2 of Acts where they went from afraid of the Roman and Jewish authorities to now they have great boldness. And what has transpired is the long-promised Holy Spirit has come upon them and has gripped them and given them great boldness, given them uh, great teaching, and has moved in such a way that people it catches people's eye. People look and, and they see... Uh, We read about the people speaking in tongues, and and they presume that these folks are drunk. And Peter stands up and begins a sermon, and he says, It's 9 o'clock in the morning. This is not uh, people who are drunk, but rather, uh, as was prophesied in the Old Testament, the Spirit has come upon God's people, and these people are prophesying in the Holy Spirit. I want to pick up in our sermon reading this morning with the last line of Peter's first sermon. Uh, So I know it says Acts 2.42. I'm going to read for us Acts 2, verses 36 to 47. Uh, The main emphasis of the sermon will be on verse 42, but this will give us a little context. So if you are willing and able, I'd invite you to please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. Again, coming to the end of Peter's first sermon, we come to verse 37. Now when, excuse me, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Our Father, as we look now at your, at your word and as we remember what you did in the early days of this your church. Lord, we pray that we too would be gripped by this terrific news, news we've sung about, news we've prayed about, news we've read about in your scriptures. God, may we not be lukewarm or indifferent to the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, but rather, Lord, may we respond with devotion. Lord, For each one of us in this room, would you show us in these next few minutes what devotion is to look like in our lives in this season. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We had a 
a family friend, family traveling through this week, and they stopped. Uh, it was during the day. I didn't see them, but uh, the kids came to play with my kids. So when I got home, I asked, you know, what they did, and these other kids, as well as my kids, love baseball. So they looked at baseball cards the whole time. And I was like, wait a minute, y'all all love baseball, and instead of going out and playing baseball, y'all looked at baseball cards? Yes. Now, in their defense, it was like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and you know how good that feels in middle Georgia in the middle of the week. My point is not to pick on them, but as they told me that, I thought, you know what, we can be that way as Christians. We can be baseball fans, people who love baseball, but really what we want to do is talk about people who play baseball and not play baseball. We can be Christians who talk about the good things the Lord has done. We talk about what the Lord's doing in different places. We talk about what he's doing on the mission field. We hear from uh, Jesse and Delane, as we did a few weeks ago. We hear from Jason this morning. We hear from, um, uh, I've lost them, but our our friends from Burundi that were here a few weeks ago. and, And we're excited about what the Lord is doing, but it's a little bit like trading cards. We're talking about it. We're not involved in it. Can you believe what God is doing in these other places? But of course, as we read the scriptures and as we think upon the holiness of God, as we think about eternity with God, as we think about what he's redeemed us from, it calls out to us that we would be devoted to him. That's what we see here in Acts chapter 2 this morning. I want to show you that because of the depth of Jesus' salvation, we must devote ourselves to him and his ways. As we think about, so going back to Peter's first sermon, as he unpacks what God has done in redemptive history to bring about so great a salvation, that cried out to the people who were cut to the heart that they would devote themselves both to Jesus and to what Jesus was doing in their midst. So I want to try to answer four questions from the text this morning. First, who are we talking about? Who are these people who are devoted? Why did they devote themselves? What did they devote to, and how were they devoted? How were they devoted? So first, and probably most briefly, who are we talking about? So again, I mentioned the disciples. You had the 12 famous followers of Jesus. Of course, one betrayed him. They added another back in that person's place. And we know of about 120 there in the first days, but then the church uh, begins to explode. And, And that's what we see happening in the text we read, verse 37 Uh, Now when they heard this, when the crowd heard Peter's sermon, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? (laughs) They they, They realized that the whole Old Testament was culminating in the work of Jesus, and everything they trusted had and were looking forward to had been fulfilled in the one who died and rose again. And so they said, What do we do? They were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And verse 41 tells us, who these people were. So those who received his word, those who believed, those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So the spirit falls on the early church and they grow from 120 to 3,120 that day. And they devote themselves to the Lord. They're the followers of Jesus. So who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about today? Well, in this sermon, in this break from the book of Judges, I'm going to challenge you to consider your devotion to Jesus. And there's however many different stories in this room. There's different seasons of life. So I'm not going to try to cookie cutter what devotion looks like in your life. I'm going to give you some things that I think will help you be devoted to Jesus. But I'm going to challenge every person individually to consider your devotion to the Lord Jesus. I expect some of you to answer that challenge. Others will refuse. I don't expect everyone to do everything I recommend. And friend, you won't ultimately give an account to me. But I do want you to be devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you find yourself cut to the heart because you recognize that the crucified Jesus is the one who was so devoted to you and is forevermore, then oh, that we might respond with devotion. So in the early days of the church, it was those who recognized Jesus was the fulfillment of scriptures. And today it is you, church, you who continue that belief. Well, why did they devote themselves to Jesus? What, What was so significant about what had taken place? Well, first we see this was a long-awaited hope. If you have your Bible open, I'm going to go back a little further than we 
had, been, had we read. Um, but remember, Peter stands up. They're accused of being drunk. Peter stands up and says, they're not drunk. This is a fulfillment. And then he goes and he quotes the prophet Joel in verse 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So Peter showing them, hey, the Old Testament scriptures are being fulfilled. What you see as people being drunk in the morning is actually what God had intended. It is this uh, pouring out of his spirit among people. He continues down in verse 22 of Acts 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So he's talking to an audience. They, you've heard. You've heard about the blind receiving sight. You've heard about the death, uh, the dead being raised. You've heard about the deaf who can hear. You've, the signs and wonders God has attested. His mighty works have been seen. Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So Peter's acknowledging this was God's plan that his son would come and he would be killed by lawless men. He would be led up to be crucified even by some that were in the crowd Peter is speaking to there. Verse 24, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So Peter testifies to the res resurrection of this Jesus who had laid down his life, this Jesus uh, who died condemned, but was raised justified. And then he quotes another prophet they respect in King David. In verse 25, he said, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. He's at the right hand. I shall not be shaken. And he speaks of, uh, verse 27, his soul not being abandoned to Hades, his holy one not seeing corruption. And, and Peter saying that David saw this day coming. That one was going to come in David's line that would be raised up. And he testifies, that's exactly what happened. That's why he was raised on the third day. His body did not see decay. He was the long-awaited and promised Messiah. Peter makes it clear in verse 30 that he sees David as a prophet, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would not set one, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and all of us are witnesses. So Peter recounts what has happened in those days. And then he also gives credit to David for David saying in verse 34, For David did not, did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Peter is showing them that Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the hope. This is why they're devoting themselves is because he's the long-awaited hope of Israel. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel there know, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter has testified to them in various ways that Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the one to be devoted to because he is the one the scriptures have been pointing to. He points out to them they've seen the disruption in the world. Jesus had turned that little part of the world upside down. They had the testimony of the signs. They had the testimony of his death. They had the testimony of those who had seen him risen from the dead. And Peter explains why he rose. And by the way, Historians, people throughout history have never been able to refute it. They never could produce the body. They can't explain what happened to Jesus of Nazareth except that he did appear to hundreds and he is at the right hand. And furthermore, friend, if you come in skeptical, skeptical today, I challenge you to look at these very disciples, these ones who were cowered in a room hiding from authorities, who now have great boldness, who went out and changed the world because they saw the risen Jesus. Furthermore, it answers our very sin problem. You and I know that we are sinners. We know we do things wrong. We know we have things in our heart. Even if it's not by God's standard, even by our own standard, we know that we do wrong things. This gospel of Jesus Christ explains the beauty and the brokenness of this world. How it could all be created good, and yet sin could mar 
every aspect of our lives. It explains the beauty and the brokenness of the people we see. How people can bear God's image and yet also obviously be sinners. It explains the the beauty and the brokenness and the hypocrisy of the church. How you can have godly people who still mess it up. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted this Jesus. I want to tell you the reason these people were devoted was because they saw, they, they heard and believed, they recognized that God had done something great in their midst, that he had made a way for sinners to be reconciled, that the one righteous one had died in the place of those who were not righteous. There's two, maybe three types of people in the room today. I say two, maybe three, because there are people who are devoted to following Jesus. I know you. I see you. I don't know every person's devotion level, but I know there are a number of people here today that I would say that's a devoted follower of Jesus. But at the same time, I recognize that every person I see as a devoted follower of Jesus would acknowledge that they need to be more devoted. No one thinks they've arrived in that department. And so that's why I say two, because there's still two more. There are those who still need verse 40 from our text. And with many words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Some of you today are still walking the wide path to destruction. Friend, if you're not devoted to Jesus, then you're devoted to yourself and ultimately to destruction. And when Peter says save yourself, he doesn't mean to do something extraordinary. He means to repent of your sins and be baptized, even as he answered their question in verse 38. But you must decide, friend. You must decide that Jesus Jesus is worthy of devotion, that you do indeed need to be forgiven of your sins. And the good news is you can repent right where you are. Right in your very seat, you can turn from your sins and entrust your sins to Jesus. This is his resume. This is what he does is he saves sinners. If you won't help with that, right after the sermon's over, right after the service, I would love to to sit down and talk with you about that. And then we can talk about the baptism part. But it begins with repentance. Friend, do not reject so great a salvation. The other type of person in the room probably covers many more of us are those who need to repent for losing our devotion many of us have lost it do you remember friend that first time you walked down the aisle and you you asked Jesus to forgive your sins do you remember that feeling of forgiveness do you remember laying in your bed one night and crying out to God to save you from your sins you remember being baptized and you, you remember the, the weight that was off your shoulders. You remember just how clear life was. No, you didn't know what you were going to do, but you were going to live for Jesus. And over time, we lose that. And he hasn't changed. And the glorious nature of what he's done for us hasn't changed. And our glorious future hasn't changed. But we've grown numb. Do you need to repent today? Have you lost that new priority that was so clear that that not only were you going to follow Jesus, but you were going to make him known. And now perhaps it's been days or weeks or months or years since you've told somebody about Jesus. It's time to repent and to ask God to restore the why to you. Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Lord, remind me of all that you saved me from that I might be rightfully devoted to you. Well, if you're here today and you do not see the beauty of devoting yourself to the risen Christ, then the rest of the sermon is a bit of a history lesson. But it is, in fact, history, and I hope you'll lean in. Third question this morning is, what did they devote themselves to? And here we look at our main text, verse 42. And they, these new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Well, let's first talk about this word devotion. To devote oneself is to persevere faithfully, to attach oneself. We've all done things with great commitment, but commitment is one thing, devotion is another. It's on another level. Think of Ruth in the Bible and how she devoted herself to Naomi and was going to care for her all the days of her life. Think about a caregiver you know, modern day, 
who has stuck by the side of a parent or a child, of a spouse or a friend or loved one, and, and they just continue to give care. That's devotion. Through thick and thin, that's devotion. And the early church devoted themselves to these four areas. And as you think about this, friend, I want you to realize it's really an either or. I realize we live in a world with a lot of gray, but, but you're either devoted or you're not devoted. And it can be hard for us. I mean, most of us, I think, would have to think, well, I'm mostly devoted, but I recognize I'm not completely devoted. But friend, I want you to think on Jesus' perspective. He's not confused. What does Jesus think of your devotion to him and his kingdom? Now, thankfully, as we've sung, he's a gracious God. He welcomed, come ye sinners, poor and needy. So we come to him with our shortcomings, with our shortcomings and our devotion and every other shortcoming. But friend, the right response is to be devoted. They were first devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now the apostles, as we've already seen here in Acts 2, are, are teaching from the Old Testament. They're teaching, they're quoting the Old Testament scriptures, and they're telling about the fulfillment of Jesus. We get a lot of their teaching in the rest of the New Testament as they write these letters explaining to us the implications of Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament. But when, when we see the apostles teaching here, what we see is the scriptures. They were devoted to the scriptures because the apostles had been given authority by Jesus to to explain what they had learned from Jesus. A verse like Colossians 3.16 comes to mind. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I think this is a mark of devotion. Do you do this, friend? Would you say, or more importantly, would Jesus say that the word of Christ dwells in you richly? Are you teaching and admonishing one another? Now, I don't mean do you have a pulpit you're teaching from, but are, is God's word part of the instruction, part of the encouragement that you give to the people around you? Are you singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to the Lord? This was their devotion. Or 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Peter writes, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Is that true of you, friend? Have you tasted that the Lord is good? Do you recognize that when you pick up his word to, to learn, you're learning about the holy God of the universe? Do you read his word that way, that, that you want to know him, that you want to prepare for eternity, that, that maybe uh, he's infinite, so we're going to be surprised by a lot when we get in his presence, but you want to know as much as you can. You want to know him, to relate to him. You want to trust him through hard things that will inevitably come in this life. Well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship, the fellowship. Uh, in the New Testament, this always has this picture of having things in common, commonality, and participation. The fellowship that we have with one another. In the context of the New Testament, it always comes with sharing. Everything's open-handed. And friend, we lose this a little bit in the United States and perhaps other countries, but this is our context. We often think of God's salvation as for me. I'm a sinner. I pray to prayer. I need to go to church. I need to worship God. I need God to do this in my life. I need to be a good Christian, but God's redeeming a people for himself. And so, yes, those things are true, but in the bigger picture, the fellowship is part of what God is doing. It's part of what's preparing us for heaven. Let me tell you, friend, it's not going to be about you in heaven. It's going to be every nation, tribe, and tongue. We're going to be a part of what we sung about earlier in Holy Forever. We're going to be a part of something fantastic. And it's not going to be about us. It's going to be about God. But we are getting to be a part of a people. We will fellowship forever with others who've been redeemed. And so we devote ourselves to one another because that's how God designed us to be. He had a people of God in the Old Covenant. He has a people of God in the New Covenant. The church is the people of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Now, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of ink has been spilt on this breaking of bread. Does it mean the Lord's Supper, or does it mean more broadly the breaking of bread, just having meals together? 
Well, we certainly participate in the Lord's Supper, so whether that's what it means here or not, that's part of following Jesus as we declare his death until he comes. We participate in communion. But we recognize that even looking at Jesus, he often shared meals with people. He got in trouble for it sometimes because he shared meals with people that the rest of society looked down upon. But I think when we see breaking of bread here, especially in context with this fellowship, we think of having meals together. We sit down around tables and we thank God for his provision and we share with one another. We, we share food, we share fellowship with one another. It's amazing what happens around tables, how relationships change as we gather around food and share our hearts. Finally, they devoted themselves to the prayers. Now again, this could be formal prayers. They were praying Jewish prayers back to God, Jewish prayers of the Old Testament scriptures, or informal prayers. At the very least, it's the latter. We know they're praying the latter because they're praying for one another as needs come up. And as I was thinking about the prayers this week and, and reading different things, one picture, and I couldn't give you the whole quote, but one picture that was given was this idea of when we pray, we are locking arms with Christ. You've seen a football team come out on the field and it's kind of yesteryear. I don't know if teams still do this, but, but when it first came out, it was pretty cool to see a whole football team coming out and their arms are locked and they're like, okay, they look ready to go. But we're locking arms with each other and with Christ when we pray. It's his kingdom come. It's his will be done. My perception when I came here in 2020 of what Byron Baptist was like, and right, wrong, or indifferent, this was just my perception, was Byron Baptist was looking for someone who would stand in this pulpit and proclaim God's truth and that sinners would be convicted and gloriously saved, and here we go. And that's a high, lofty good. And I don't know that I met that necessary dream, that situation. And I'm not up here to feel sorry for myself. I'm seeking to be faithful and Lord do with it what he will. But I want to give you another idea, another picture. What if God's desire for Byron Baptist Church was not a great preacher, but a devoted people? What if it wasn't so much about Peter in Acts chapter 2, but rather the church and what the church did and their devotion? Friends, I've shared the gospel many times in the last few years, not as many as I would like, but many times. And I've just not seen much fruit. And maybe you're the same way. The soil is tough out there in our day. And nearly everyone I talk to agrees it is difficult sharing the good news of Jesus in our day. But when I look at the book of Acts, I recognize that they're seeing a lot of conversions. And I look at our lives, and it doesn't look anything like the book of Acts. Our lives look essentially nothing like those in the book of Acts. Generously speaking, the average Christian in America comes to church every other week. And statistics would say little other devotion to the Lord. So basically, the average Christian in America is given one out of every 14 days, or a portion of one out of every 14 days, to Jesus and his church. And we read here in the book of Acts, they were together day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They were 14 out of 14. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Early on in my time here, I was told by a gentleman uh, who went on to leave the church, but he told me in the most respectful way, he did it right, just a disagreement, but, but he told me that if I couldn't say it in 20 minutes, it wasn't worth saying. He wanted three songs, 20-minute sermon, be out of here in less than an hour. And I, he did it the right way. We met in person. It was 101. He was kind. He went on his way after that. But I told him, I said, I, I hear you, and I, I realize we live in a world of TED Talks, and everybody, you know, 10 minutes is good for, for everybody. But I said, I'm not giving my life to that. Like, I just refuse to give my life to so shallow a generation that we can't give an hour to God's Word. By the way, if you're new here, I'm not about to preach for an hour, but broadly speaking, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to give my life to that. And in the same boat, though I haven't seen the fruit I would have wanted to see in the last four years, I'm not going to give my life to the status quo. Like, I don't care 
we'll try anything that pleases God around here. But as I look at the book of Acts and I think about the frustrations we've had in evangelism and the difficulties we've faced, I think, well, wow, they are, they're devoted to the scriptures and the breaking of bread and the fellowship and the prayers. So, friend, when Jesus looks down from the right hand of God the Father Almighty, when he's seated on his throne and he sees you, what does he see you devoted to? Now, don't hear a preacher trying to get something out of you. Hear a preacher trying to prepare you for eternity. Hear a preacher pointing you not to a condemning throne, but to a throne of grace. So what does that look like for Byron Baptist in 2024? Well, that language I used from... Or Paul used in Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It means when you come, when you come to Sunday school, when you come to sit under a sermon, when you go to Bible study, come eager to learn from God's word, even if you've heard it. That particular passage two dozen times. God's word is living and active. Believe it. Come eager. Come eager to learn when you go and do your devotions in the Lord, with the Lord in the mornings or evenings. Be eager to apply all that you can from God's word to your life. Your fellowship and participation. It means when you gather with this people, if you could be here a few minutes early, be here early to fellowship with one another. If you can stay afterwards, stay after. Get to know one another, care for one another. Ask somebody how you can pray for them this week. And then the next week, say, I've been praying for you. How are you doing? Be a part of a Sunday school. Join a small group or a D group. Be in home, have people in your homes. Be around others. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. It went okay for them. The Lord's Supper is certainly part of our uh, bread we break together. We look at the example of Jesus in the early church. We see this, this beauty in sharing meals. We see this beauty in prayer, praying with and for God's people. I honestly don't necessarily know how good many or hardly any of your prayer lives are, but I know personally that mine got better when I started going to Monday morning prayer two churches ago up in Macon. It was just a group of people, not unlike the Monday afternoon prayer we have here, when we just gathered and prayed for a number of things, and and hearing one another's prayers just helped my own prayer life. It encouraged me. It taught me how to pray better. It gave me a greater desire to pray. It dealt with a hypocrisy in my heart when I realized I pray a lot better out loud than I do when it's just me and God. Regardless, the pattern in Acts is praying together. And so let us be a people devoted to prayer. Finally this morning, how were they devoted? Well, they were devoted with awe. Look at verse 43. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, as we gather and pray, are we going to see wonders and signs? I don't know. It's not, a, it's not beyond God to do wonders and signs, but I, I am confident we will see God work. It may not look like it looked like in the book of Acts, but I bet you if God's people gather more intently to pray, give ourselves to these things that we see in the Scriptures, we will be smiling and rejoicing and hugging one another as we recognize God's answered prayers. Furthermore, in verses 44 and 45, they had all things in common. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, this is where we go from, okay, it's a pretty good sermon, to now you're on my toes, preacher. Selling all my possessions? Hey, I'm, I'm with you. This one's uncomfortable for me, too. I will point out to you, though, in verse 46, they're still meeting in people's homes. So they didn't sell literally everything. But here's what I'll say. We have to hold everything loosely. When we love God above all and we love our neighbor as ourselves, everything we hold, we hold loosely. It's surrendered to God. It's devoted to God. They were meeting day by day. Look at verse 46. How were they devoted? They were and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Friend, you're going to give an account to God one day. I'm going to give an account to God one day. Hebrews 13, 17 tells me I'm going to give an account for your souls. But I wonder when I give an account to God one day about this particular sermon, if he's going to tell me I'll let you off easy. I'm about to ask you for more of your time on Sunday evening 
and perhaps more of your time on Wednesday. But I read here, they were day by day. And I think I'm making a big ask. I'm pushing back against the American calendar a little bit. But I wonder if in the end, the sermon will have set the bar too low. Now, I trust in God's providence. If it has, he'll continue to build a passion in our people and we will meet more and more. I don't know. But what I see here is the people are gathered in homes with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And, and look at this, verse 47, they're praising God and having favor with all the people. What a contrast to what we face today. As a maligned group of Christians, or in the South, we're not so much maligned, but people are indifferent to us. That's what I, I, I feel like I share the gospel. People agree they're sinners. They agree Jesus rose from the dead. They just don't care. Oh, that we would have favor with the people, that the Lord would add to our number day by day. So how do we get there? Well, there are two things I'm asking you to consider this fall. First is Sunday evening prayer. Starting next Sunday, uh, we'll meet at Larson's home. We're going to meet. We've got a variety of families who've opened up their home. If you want to open up yours, you can let me know. But uh, next Sunday, uh, the address will be made public between now and then. Uh, we'll meet at 6 o'clock. We'll pray starting promptly at 630 we're going to pray for the, the sick in our church. We're going to pray for our country. We'll pray for our own needs. And we're going to pray for conviction of sin. We're going to pray for God to be working in the hearts of those around us. You don't have to pray aloud. You don't have to pray well. Did you hear that? You don't have to pray well. The impressive prayers of Jesus' day did not impress Jesus. He calls us to a childlike faith. So that's, that's a corporate prayer initiative, and, and along with that, um, an intimate prayer initiative. And so Wednesday nights are going to pivot to more of this intimate prayer in our D groups. So much of the growth I've seen in people in the last few years has been those who've chosen to join D groups and commit themselves to small groups of the same gender seeking to grow together. Now, I want to extend our Wednesday nights in part for the sake of our youth and our children to make it easier for our young families to be able to, to kind of do all these things in one night. Uh, we'll see how that part goes, but this is for all ages. And this Wednesday night, I'm going to unpack, we'll meet in the fellowship hall this Wednesday night at 630, and I'm going to unpack what it looks like and what effort it would take on your part to be a part of one of these D groups. No commitment this Wednesday, just come and listen. And I'm not saying that we've crafted the perfect discipleship plan, but I earnestly believe that anyone who is seeking to honestly answer these questions, one page of answers per week out of the sermon and out of your own personal quiet times, anyone who's seeking to answer these questions is a growing Christian. I think this is growing in devotion. You're treasuring the things of heaven. Now, again, I can't tell you personally exactly how you are to be devoted I can't tell you exactly how you're to store up treasure in heaven. But I do believe one of these groups will help you in that aim. I particularly challenge you, if you're sitting here today and you recognize for the last three months or more, you've been spiritually stagnant. Your faith has not grown. Your love and devotion for the Lord has not grown. Your prayer life has not grown. Come try this. By faith. Gather with other people who are struggling but seeking also to walk by faith. So, preacher, are you saying this is the new standard for being a good member of Byron Baptist? No, nope. I don't get to set the standard. I say in the membership class, this gathering is the standard. I say making disciples, being part of discipleship is also, but how that looks is different for every person. But I am trying to help you think through your devotion to Jesus. I'm trying to give you tools to help your devotion to Jesus. I'm trying to shape our church to be devoted. I'm trying to help us reach a lost and dying world. And every time I analyze how a gospel conversation went, I recognize the greater need for us to pray. Not to pray broadly for the lost, but pray specifically for the people we care about, the people we're sharing about. I'm trying to help us to grow in Christ's likeness. I want you and me to store up treasure in heaven. I want us to steward well the time we have left. Friend, Jesus did not die only for those sinners who met daily for prayer or even came to church three times a week. But if you belong to Jesus, the only logical decision is to obey him. Arguably, you should do a lot more than come for Sunday school and worship and Sunday prayer and D groups and some fellowship. 
Again, I have no qualifications for shaping how a hundred or so people follow Jesus. I'm trying to give you some broad opportunities to devote yourself, both individually and corporately, to him. I know that there will be devoted followers of Jesus who do not come to everything at the church. I know. I don't care so much about the specifics. I care that you're devoted, that you're answering to the Lord Jesus. Some of these are at night. If you have trouble driving at night, guess what? What better part of fellowship than picking you up and taking you with us? You need to know more specifically about how devotion to look in your life? I'd be glad to meet with you. But ultimately, ask Jesus. Seek to please him, not me. Trust him with the results. In conclusion this morning, being devoted to Jesus and his church is a worthy devotion. Because of the depth of Jesus' salvation, we must devote ourselves to him and his ways. Just as those who made up the early church were cut to the heart when they recognized Jesus as Lord and devoted themselves to his word, people, and prayer, so we will do well to devote ourselves. You can trust him. You can trust him with your schedule. You can trust him that 10,000 years from now, you will be glad you devoted yourself to he and his people. You can even trust him when you can't or don't follow through on what you might should do. But by all means, friend, trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise you once more for so great a salvation you have wrought us in our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the sweet testimony of the early church. Lord, that doubtless changed the world. 10,000 miles away, we are here singing of the name of a risen rabbi who is also king of kings and lord of lords. And so, Father, as we each think about our individual devotion, as we think corporately about our devotion to him, may we be a people found faithful. Lord, we know you're worthy. Lord, give us soft hearts. Give us obedient hearts. Give us hearts that are eager to honor you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come now to our fi final song, a song of response. Uh, the musicians are going to play a uh, time or two through the song so that you can pray. You can pray where you're at, down front. If you've never repented of your sins and trusted this Jesus, I'll be right here. I'd love to begin that conversation with you. But you respond as the Lord leads. You determine or at least seek to determine in the days ahead what devotion to Jesus looks like in this season of your life and surrender it to him. And then when you're good and ready and the musicians are singing, you feel free to stand and join and sing as well. <laughs>